following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today, we are going to explain under the light of Kabbalah and alchemy about Abraham. And because in many lectures, we always address Abraham as the innermost, the Sephirah Chesed, which is precisely the seven Sephirah, counting them from the bottom to the top. So, as you know, Abraham is, uh, or they gave unto him the foundation of three monotheistic religions. First, Judaism, then uh, uh, Christianity, and Islam. All of them claim that Abraham is in the very foundation of uh, their religion. And we understand why, but I don't know if all of these uh, followers of these three monotheistic religions understand who Abraham is. So we are going to explain about him, but from the archetypical point of view. We are going to touch some, uh, sometimes the history about uh, this great uh, prophet and avatar that is described in the book of Genesis. Remember that uh, Abraham really is uh, the father, his meaning is the father of many. And uh, as I said, uh, to him is attributed the three uh, monotheistic religions. With this, we are implying that monotheism is uh, different, or we will say the opposite of polytheism. These words are Greek words. Poly means many. And it seems that Abraham uh, in, in Hebrew means father of many. And uh, Theos is God in Greek. So we use Greek words in order to point at one only God, poly, I mean mono, because as you know, we always talk about the monad. <coughs> and the monad uh, comes from monas. And the word mono is one, monotheism. We will say uh, the belief in only one God. But we have many other religions, as you know, in Asia, 
And also here in America, ancient uh, religions from the natives, they're uh, also related with polytheism. Poly is many and theos, God, many gods. And uh, I uh, dare to say also that even the atheists relate to Abraham. Because most of the atheists in this day and age refuse and fight against Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, whose founder is Abraham. And Theos is God. So thanks to God, they are atheists. Because if that word Theos didn't exist, they wouldn't say that they are atheists. You know, the, word, the letter A means without. So we will say that uh, atheism is, uh, uh, is rooted in monotheism. This is why uh, the Master Samael explains in the book uh, uh, The Revolution of Dialectic. He said that the abuse of polytheism gave birth monotheism. And the abuse of monotheism gave birth atheism. And, and it is because uh, polytheism, I mean monotheism in this day and age, people believe in only one God. And uh, that God, they think, is an old man in the clouds throwing lightnings and thunders against this humanity. Which indeed, uh, uh, that uh, God doesn't exist. Because God, as you know, in Hebrew is Elohim, which is a plural word, which means gods and goddesses. So the very root in the Bible, when they talk about Elohim in the book of Genesis, talk about uh, polytheism. But the people that believe in only one God don't like to hear that. And it's because they do not understand how this only CET, as we call it in Gnosticism, is at the base either polytheism or monotheism. Because that only one CET is not uh, the universe, or it doesn't exist in the universe. As the Master Samael states, is the space itself. Is that we call it a city, an intelligence that is everywhere. So we, the Gnostics, we uh, study polistic monotheism. So from that point of view, we understand what polytheism is and what monotheism is as well. So this lecture will be based on that in order for us to understand who Abraham is. We find in the Bible that after uh, the universal flood that destroyed the Atlantean civilization came the generation of Noah. And the generation of Jonah, of, uh, I mean of Noah, I say Jonah because for me uh, it's the same symbol. We know that he had uh, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are the three sons, which alchemically and Kabbalistically we always associate them with uh, three solar bodies that we had to create, astral, mental, and solar bodies. But of course, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are represented in many ways, alchemically and Kabbalistically speaking. In other lectures, we stated that, three, that this, uh, these uh, three children of Noah represent also the last three sub-races 
of the Atlantean civilization that were uh, the root of our present Aryan race. So after Noah and his sons came out of the Ark of the Covenant, as we know, this Ark symbolizes this doctrine that we are teaching here. Anybody that was entering the Atlantean epoch into the Ark, meaning into the mysteries of this Arcanum, they were, of course, practicing the Arcanum AZF. As an, as an outcome of that, all of those uh, uh, initiates that were uh, emerging from this doctrine were creating Shem, Ham, and Japhet within things that they were uh, following their own particular nous or Noah. And this is how we understand that Noah and his three sons were the only ones that were saved from the universal flood. It's not pointing at uh, four people or at uh, even the, their wives as well that were there in all the animals. Because we gave a lecture related with it when we said that after that universal flood and when they came out of the ark, meaning when they were already born spiritually speaking, they came out of the matrix, came out of the womb of the Divine Mother. Then the, that is statement that follows that we talk about in other lectures, that God said, uh, into your hands I command all the animals, birds, etc., etc. And this is how we will say the golden age of our present Aryan root race started. But when we read the book of Genesis, we also discover that the children or the generation of Adam was uh, aware they were also uh, building the Tower of Babel. You read it there in those chapters in Genesis. So we find here the difference between the children of Adam or the generation of Adam and the generation of Noah. The generation of Adam, as you know, were those people that uh, were disobedient to the law given unto them in that Lemurian continent situated in the Pacific Ocean. As disobedient as they were of the law, or the arcanum, they, of course, were trying to enter into heaven, onto the mysteries of the tree of life through false doors. And they were the ones that built the Tower of Babel, where there were confusion of tongues. And among them, of course, were the children of the generation of Noah, that were, of course, following the right law. You can read that in the book of Genesis. So, of course, uh, the Golden Age developed in our present Aryan root race, but uh, uh, the light, the golden light of that Golden Age diminished as uh, there were appearing people that were not following the rules of uh, the arcana, or the mystery of the mysteries of heaven. And uh, it is stated in the book of Genesis that these are the generations of the sons of Noah. 
which is another step. You see, one thing is the generation of Noah, like in this case, for instance, we, who received the doctrine from Samael on the or, and we have the doctrine pure still there in his books, we are following the instructions of the master avatar, Samael on the or. So anyone that emerges with the astral, mental, and solar bodies within is, of course, we will say, a son of Samael, because this is doctrine. So we will say this will be the generation, the generation of Samael. But after that comes, of course, with time, people that uh, altered, adulterate, adulterate the, the doctrine, and then it appears this is, uh, or these are the generations of the sons of Noah. We are the children of Samael, but later on appears the generation of, or the outcome of our doctrine or our teachings, which obvious because of the ego, the doctrine degenerates. So among the post-Diluvians, the one that emerges after the, the Ark of Noah and that doctrine in the root race that emerged, there were, of course, uh, different branches, we will say, related always with these three sons, which if we apply that to the three uh, brains in a human body, we understand the mind, ham, the heart, we will associate it with Shem, and Yesod, sexual, instinctual, sexual energy, with Japhet. Because there we find the sexual potency, which is always associated with willpower in relation with Tifereth, which is a causal body. So, Shem, that kept the doctrine, which is the root, as you know, as our, our root race, because we explain in other lectures that the Shemites were the ones that founded our present root race. And Shem is precisely the first son of Noah. So this organization of the Shemites started in Atlantis and developed until the origin of our root race, which is called the Aryan race, or the, uh, the root, uh, uh, the race of the Gentiles. So, you find in the Bible how Shem generated children and daughters, I mean, sons and daughters there, and among the lineage of Shem, at the very bottom of that chapter, I believe is the 11th chapter of Genesis, <coughs> you find Abraham. So Abraham comes from the root of Shem, which means the name, which is the meaning. You know that when we say Shem, the name is always associated with yod He vav He. And... Uh, at the very end of the chapter 12, not 11, but 12, you read, And yod Hava said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. This is Genesis 12, chapter 1 to 3. So that's the beginning, of course, of what you read uh, of, uh, of Judaism. Now, 
Abraham, at that time, when he received that uh, command from yod heh vav -He, as you can see in the right, the graphic, yod heh vav -He, in relation with the tree of life, you find that is related with the whole tree of life. We cannot fall into the mistake of thinking that this yod heh vav -He, or yod Haba is an individual. Cannot give him an anthropomorphic form because then we fall into idolatry. People think that to be an idolater is to worship a statue. And this is it. No. Idolatry is also those people that think that God is a person there in the clouds and making a puppet of God. And as we said, God is Elohim, gods and goddesses. So therefore, yod heh vav -He that said to Abraham that is something that we have to study right now in order for us to comprehend. Because this Abraham is Chesed, the fourth Sephirah, counting from the top. Keter, Chochma, Bina, Chesed, the fourth. Which is the first emanation of the Holy Three Unity, or Trinity, that we call Keter, Chochma, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are three forces. Call it also holy affirming, holy negation, and holy conciliation. Now, these three primary forces emerge from the unknowable divine. We, in many lectures, stated that that Ein Sof is precisely the unmanifested city. That unmanifested city is a womb, it's a matrix from where all the universe emerged. And it's always symbolized by the letter He. That's why when we name uh, uh, the name of the only God, we say this only God is two unities. The first unity is represented by the three unity or trinity that we call Keter Chokma Bina, and that are represented by the three primary letters of the holy name of God, Yod He Vav. In Gnosticism, we call it Iao, but this Iao or Yod He Vav emerged from the He, which is the unknowable, divine. That is what we call the Ein Sof, that uh, Matthew Samael explains in different manners. I will see it in the Tree of Life. You see here, we find the Ein Sof or the Ein Sof in the Ein. This is the unknowable. And the first manifestation of that unknowable before entering into the universe is what we call the spiritual absolute sun. And this is precisely what uh, we have to understand, what uh, is the unique or only God. In Arabic, according to my understanding, they named that God Allah. There, Kabbalistically, we see Aleph Lamed, Lamed Aleph, two Lameds, to Alephs, Allah, which for me is a beautiful way to syncretize because El in Hebrew is God as well as in Arabic. But La is precisely No in Hebrew. You see? When you want to say No in Hebrew, you said La. So when you said El in Kabbalah means no God. And when they say that Allah is the only God, 
they know God, then we understand they are associating L with the space that we call Ain. No, you see? Nothing. La. So, la, no God. But that Allah is not a person, as many people misunderstand, is a city which is diluted in the space and is not only in our solar system, is everywhere in the universe. All the galaxies are floating into that Allah. And this is how we have to understand it. Marxi Samael Kabbalistic called that a Elohim. We call it in many names. But that is the fact that when we read that Yod He Vav He, Kabbalistically speaking, what saying to Abraham, get out from your country, from your family, and from the place where you are to a land that I will show you. <coughs> what is that land? If we talk literally and we don't know how to interpret Kabbalistically and alchemically what we are reading in Genesis, we might think, oh yeah, because this says the land of Canaan. And this is that the land of Canaan is there in the Middle East, is where Israel is in these present times. But that is something that we have to comprehend and to understand. That Canaan in, 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 Kabbalist, in Kabbalah and alchemy relates to Malkut. It is the descension of Abraham, which is Hesed, into Malkut. In order to start doing the work. All of you that come here, listen to these lectures, and that have uh, or, be, or believe in different religions, whether Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, or Taoism, doesn't matter what. We come here because we hear inside of us, or we feel there's something we have to find in order to start our path, our journey to our own particular God. And for that, only Abraham, not anyone, I mean, Kabbalistically speaking, only Abraham can do that for us. But this Abraham is inside. It's not outside. People think of Abraham like this prophet that whose name was Abraham and that he came to represent that archetype that all of us have here, inside. And that in Hebrew is called Abraham. But in that polytheistic religion called Hinduism, they call it Brahma. You see how, how equal is that? Brahma. Just take the A from Brahma and put it in the beginning. And then you will read no Brahma, but Abraham. You see, the, in the beginning was the word. It's just different ways of saying things. <coughs> so this Brahma or Abraham is inside of us. It's not outside. And when we read in the Bible that he is receiving this commandment saying, Go out of your country. Your land and of your family to a land that I will show you. That is the promised land. The promised land, of course, is the superior part of Malkut. Malkut is our physicality, our physical body. But we have to understand that Malkut, our physical body, cannot exist without its foundation, without the tetradimensional part of it, and that is the vital body, 
that in Kabbalah is called Yesod. So Yesod and Malkut are one. So the dissension of the spirit into Canaan, which is cursed, is in order to work, in order to enter into the promised land, which is Yesod. You understand that? Follow with me. When Noah came out of the ark, he drank. He got drunk, as is written. This type of uh, drunkness relates to the spiritual level in which he was. And he saw many things in that inebriation that he couldn't understand. So his mind became a stone. That mind is Ham. Shem is the actual body. Ham is the mind. And Japheth is a causal body. In relation with these solar bodies. So Ham was astounded. Astounded. And he saw the neckness. The nakedness, thank you. Of his father. That does not mean that he uh, saw him physically naked. No. There are many stances that you can read in the Bible about nakedness when it related with ignorance. When the capacity that you have in your self in order to understand what God is, is not enough. You realize that you still need to dress yourself more with more wisdom. And the mind, which is Ham, is the one that realizes that. While the other two boys of Noah didn't see his neckness, but the mind, yeah, neckness, nakedness, nakedness, his nakedness. <laughs> you see now, right? At least that, that's good because then you will understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> All of you are naked. So anyhow, this ham, of course, you see that Noah, he says, who saw me naked? He says, ham. But he didn't say, damn it, be ham. He says, the, uh, curse be Canaan. And he starts saying many things against Canaan. He says, what is Canaan? Canaan is not here. It's going to be the son of ham. Is going to be. He still is not having any children. But how come Noah says that? And it's because when you see that, when you fall into that state, mentally, your mind makes you fall. And then you descend into Malkut again. You know, and to start and to acquire more degrees of objective reasoning in order to, to see what you or to comprehend what you didn't comprehend. So Canaan, of course, is Malkut, fallen. And you know that we physically are cursed. Because when the when Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, cursed be the earth and the land because of your transgression is what is written in the book of Genesis. Now, Malkut is the outcome of the left side hmm? of the tree of life. You might say, well, but Ham is the mind. And it is because, according to Kabbalah, also, Shem represents the right side. The positive side of the tree of life. Ham represents the left side. I'm not talking about sephira here, you know, a particular sephira. Only the columns, the pillars. And the central pillar represents Japheth. So you saying Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three columns of the tree of life. When you create the astral body, thanks to the right side, Shem, it comes and crystallizes in the astral body, which is hot, to fortify the left column. 
In the left column, which is the mine, HAM, when we make it solar, it goes into the right, which is Nesach, in order to receive the strength of the right. This is how alchemically you see it. How this Sephiroth and pillars of the tree of life work in relation with the book of Genesis. Because when you study Kabbalah and alchemy, you understand that Chokhmah, which is the Christ, reflects in Hod. And Yod Elohim, Bina, represents the mind in the right side, Nestach, Nestach. So you see how they cross. Just a hint, because we need to study very deeply the tree of life in order to understand about Abraham. And Abraham, of course, is underneath Chokhmah, which Chokhmah is called yod he vav he as well, in the tree of life. So, the Bible says that Abraham lived in the city of Or. The Bible write Ur. But when you read the Hebrew letters, it's Aleph, Vav, Resh, Aur. That means light. So Abraham, as an archetype, lived in Or, or Ur, the light, of the Chaldeans. That's what they said. The Chaldeans. But here we find how you read Chaldean in the Bible. Hashedim. You see? This is how it's written. Hashedim. This is, say, this is how the Aramaic people, or people from the past, was naming Chaldean. <clears throat> because if you want to make sense of the word Chaldean with this letter, you don't find them. The word is Hashedim. And uh, Abraham was from the city of Or, of the Hashedim. And when you look in the dictionary about the meaning of Hashedim, that they said are the Chaldeans. This is the meaning of Hashidim is demon, devil, fiend, goblin, gremlin, sprite, boogie, phantom, genie, ghost, ghoul, gnom, of goblin, incubus, etc., etc. And all of that it says, this is precisely why. Uh, Shimon ben Hohai in the Zohar says, well, he was living among wicked people. Right? Will you read that? Of course, yeah. All of this, you, are, you associate it with wicked people. But why are all the Hashidim, all the, all the, how you call the Chaldeans? When you investigate that alchemically, esoterically, you discover that, that they dwell in the seventh dimension. It relates to the innermost. That's why we wrote above uh, this graphic. Before the fall down came over this earth, those who survived the hurricane and the storm gave praise to the innermost and to them appear the heralds of the dawn. That is from the book uh, uh, the, uh, Spring of Youth, the day of Spring of Youth of uh, Master Moria. The thing is that if you observe the graphic that we put here in the middle, this is what the Bible said that Abraham was worship, worshiping. Not only Abraham, but also Isaac and Jacob. They worship El Shaddai. But Shaddai, if you take 
the kaf and the mem, which is plural. You just put it there, shadi, shadai or shadi, you will find the same again in the dictionary, the same meaning. Right? And this is precisely El Shaddai, which means El is God. Right? We will say that the translation will, will, will be the demon God. If we are following the rules of what we're reading. And this is what is written at the doors past of any uh, Jew, which is very orthodox. They kiss that and they touch it every time that they go out or go in. El Shaddai is the guardian of the door. It's because door is Yesod, a sexual force. This is the power of Lucifer, in other words. And we know that. The power of Lucifer is in Yesod, which is El Shaddai. And there is where Abraham was working with El Shaddai, because El Shaddai dwells in the promised land. But this promised land is not three-dimensional. It's a fourth dimension, which is related with Yesod. This is what we have to understand. Let us see this other here you find. Yesod. This El Shaddai is translated as the Almighty God in the Bible, right? But really, you see the, the, the meaning of, of that name, right? Is this is Yesod, which is the promised land, or the fourth dimension, because Canaan, which is the outcome of fornication, is cursed, which is Malkut, the physical earth, whether it's Asia, whether it's Europe, the Middle East, Africa, America, all of this planet is cursed. And for your news, or maybe you know it already, this planet is inhabited by demons. And this is precisely what people still do not realize. They always picture extraterrestrials as evil that come to conquer the earth where only angels live. Right. But in this day and age, it's not that, uh, how you call, uh, exaggeration if I tell you that this planet is a planet of demons. Because it is. We are inhabited by demons, no matter where. Some of those demons are very fanatical, and they believe the chosen ones. We, in this school, we recognize that we are demons, and we have, want to stop being demons. But the path towards becoming an angel is not easy. You have to renounce being a demon. And people love the demon state. And this is precisely what you find in this graphic. When they are telling you, I will take you to a promised land, it's Yesod. Because in order to go there, you have to make your own bodies, you have to work with Yesod in order to go into Yesod. So, Abraham is what we call the innermost. Is that part of uh, of us that is called the innermost, the spirit? When we pray that uh, uh, wonderful prayer given by Master Jesus that states, "Our Father." Who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, etc., etc. That prayer goes to Yod He Vav He, which is the very root of Abraham. 
because he was he came from or from the light but from also from those hashidim when you study more kabbalah and alchemy you find that these hashidim are igneous particles of any logos that develop in nature you find for instance that uh, the gnomes are hashidim Igneous particles that uh, enlighten the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, we call it elementals, and many other uh, philosophies, they call it gnomes, pygmies, as you see there, the meaning of Hashidim, you were reading it, and they exist, but they exist in the fourth dimension. Not in the three-dimensional world. When you uh, practice uh, with the elementals or the plants or minerals or, or animals, they are Hashidim. They are in evolution in the mineral, plant, and animal kingdom. But of course, they are still... Uh, in development but they are intelligent personally I had many uh, practices for instance with cats cats at Hashidim that uh, have uh, used uh, the physical body of a cat as a vehicle physical vehicle but also I have experiences with plants Hashidim of plants and they are not as you uh, depicted in this day and age uh, uh, like demons or like ugly creatures. No, they are beautiful beings made of light. Call, it, uh, call them uh, fairies, if you liked. But they exist in the fourth dimension, in that promised land that uh, the Bible talks about. Because if you interpret the Bible, uh, the dead letter, you may think that the promised land is there uh, where people are fighting and killing each other. Mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous. I was there uh, many years ago and uh, of uh, Holy didn't have anything. But anyhow, there you find what we call Ishmael. Here we wrote in the Tree of Life in the in Malkut, Ishmael or Ismael, as many others say, that was the first child of Abraham. And it is because first we appear as Ishmael or Ishmael. Do not fall into the mistake of thinking that uh, Ishmael or the root of Ishmael in the tradition of speaking are only the Arabs. The word Ishmael implies the whole Aryan root race in alchemy and Kabbalah. Ishmael means he who listened to God. You see? He who listened to God. When you study the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, or any sacred book, and start inquiring the meaning of it, you are listening to God. In many lectures, we taught you that in order to listen to God, you have to activate the seven chakras, or the seven churches of Asya your physicality because if you interpret the sacred books with your intellect based on what, on your five senses you don't go beyond you don't understand according to my own experience i understand that in order to comprehend what i read in sacred books we need to activate the seven chakras that are taught in in, in, in yoga Muladhara, Shwadistana, Manipura, 
Anahata Vishura Agna en Sahasrara. Those are the seven chakras that have to be activated in order for us, when we go into the Bible and read it, we understand what we're reading. It's through those how we listen. Or, or we will say how we understand the doctrine. So that is Ishmael. And Ishmael was a son of Agar, the Egyptian. And this is how you find the meaning of Malkut in, the, in Kabbalah. Egypt, or what is translated as Egypt in the Bible is called Mizraim. This is how you write it. Mem, Zari, Resh, Yod, Final Mem. Mizraim. And that is translated as Egypt in this day and age. But this Mizraim is Malkut, which begins with also with Mem. Malkut means kingdom. Mizraim means Egypt. Below you find that if you take the letter Zadik from the word Mizrahim, you find the word Miriam. Miriam, which is translated in, in English as Mary. As you know, as you understand, it's written in the New Gospel of Christianity that the Holy Spirit, Bina, descended in the shape of a white dove in order to fecundate Malkut. And from Malkut emerged Jesus. Miriam is Malkut. Which in Kabbalah is called the Shekinah. You see, Shekinah. But this Shekinah is not physical. The glory of Shekinah that we always associate with Malkut is the light of the Kundalini, the fire of the Holy Ghost that rises in the spinal medulla of our physicality. That's Shekinah. And this is what we now still work with. We always worship Shekinah, the Divine Mother, because I know that from Miriam is how all the work that we have to do emerges, which is our physicality. And if we take the, re the letter Resh for Miriam, we find the word Mayim. And what is this Mayim? It's also our physicality, because this means waters. Mayim means waters. And what waters are we talking about? We're talking about the two waters that we have in our physicality. The cerebral spinal fluid is the first water that is called the waters of heaven. And the sexual fluid in our genitalia, that's called the other waters, two waters. In between these two waters, you find the letter Yad. The letter Yad is a Shakti potential the spiritual force that we need to work with. But who is the one that has to work with those mayim or waters of the Shakti potential that we see related with our physicality? Abraham. Because Abraham is the father of many. First, thanks to that fire in the sexual act, Animals exist, plants exist, and humanoids exist. We are children of the sexual act. But without the fire, we cannot engender children. But whether we are Jews, whether we are Muslims, whether they are Hindus, Christians, in alchemy, we call us ourselves Ishmael. He who listened. Not Everybody in this planet is Ishmael. Because people like to watch football, baseball, wrestling, 
or go to the movies, and they are not interested in studying this type of doctrine that relates to God, to El. But those that like that relate to Ishmael. So we are, we will say, alchemically, Kabbalistically speaking, Ishmael. We are listening. If we practice, then we will enter and become the children of the promise, which is Isaac, which is Geburah. You see? Because Malkut is nothing but an extension of Geburah. If we live here in this physical plane just as everybody, we'll be always at the level of Shmel, if we are listening to the doctrine. Ishmael had many sects in Islam, many sects in Judaism, many sects in Christianity, and in Hinduism, and they study there. But Ishmael has fallen into, or has fallen into the mistake of thinking that by believing, they will go up into the tree of life and to experience the promised land. The, the world of the Assad. And it's not like that. Because uh, in order to enter into the mysteries of the tree of life, we have to engender Isaac. But remember, as our innermost has life in our physicality, because that's the spirit, our only spirit, is given life to this physicality that we have. But this is Ishmael. That spirit can engender inside of us Isaac. And then we were children of the promise. But this Isaac is not being born by believing, but by alchemy, by practicing the doctrine of Kabbalah and alchemy within. Eventually that Isaac is born and then we start seeing all of these mysteries of the promised land that we read in the book of Genesis. Otherwise, we won't understand what is written. So Ishmael and Isaac are the two children of Abraham. Right now, we will say that Abraham, the innermost, is the father of many. Of course, Kabbalistically speaking. But very few have Isaac within which is the one that, according to the Bible, said this is the one that will follow the promise inside. Because this Isaac had to be born inside. We will say Isaac is, very, is born within Ishmael. First Ishmael. You believe, you understand, you comprehend the doctrine. But then you start building Isaac. Whether you are a Jew, a Muslim, Christian, Hindu, it doesn't matter. Maybe we will find the other names in other archetypes, in other religions, because we're talking here about uh, Kabbalah and alchemy related with, with, with uh, Hebrew language. But this is how you understand. So he said, as you see here, is up in the seventh dimension, far away. Chesed is that what the Bible call, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering upon the face of the waters. Remember, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was empty and without form. And darkness was upon the face of the abyss. But the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. That is in relation with your physicality. Your spirit, your innermost Abraham moves 
in your waters. Your cerebral spinal fluid and your sexual fluid. If you commit the mistake of fornicating, then Abraham will have children with Agar, the Egyptian. And all of us are children of Agar. We follow the doctrine, we love the doctrine, we study it, we read it. But we are still here in this physical plane, so we want to experience. And for that we have to be children of Sarah. And Sarah is the symbol of the two polarities, the moon and the sun, in relation with the work of the waters of Abraham. That's why when we enter into this knowledge, we find uh, that the symbol of all of this is the star of Solomon. That is also called the star of David. People think that the star of David or the star of Solomon is only the emblem of Judaism, or as we call now there in the flag of Israel. But when you study other religions, you find that the hexagram is in Hinduism, the hexagram is in Buddhism, and it is a symbol that represents the logos. The word, Christ. It's not a symbol that belongs to a particular religion. As well as when you study uh, the runes, you find the swastika. The swastika doesn't belong to the, to the Germans. The swastika is a symbol that is, uh, you, you find among the Mayans, Aztecs, and many other religions. That Hitler used that in the wrong way, that's another point. Another matter. But the star of six points, of course, as the Master Samael explained, is the symbol of the Logos. It has six points, which are male. And between the points, there are six deep entrances, which are female. Thus, this break down in a total as 12 rays. These 12 rays, in turn, come to crystallize in the 12 zodiacal constellations. You find this symbol of the six-pointed star in different books, different religions, especially in Kabbalah and alchemy. The six-pointed star <coughs> points also to Malkut, our physicality, as you see, because the six points are male, and the other six entrances are female. And then relates with the 12 zodiacal signs. That's why we have 12 months in the year. And you know that uh, the 12 months of the year are related to the 12 constellations, or 12 zodiacal signs, which are called the 12 tribes of Israel. In synthesis, all the 12 tribes of Israel relate to the whole planet esoterically, alchemically speaking. It depends on which sign you are born, you will find the association of the tribe. This doctrine was given to a certain elite in the past. It was passing from mouth to ear through many centuries. Now this elite thinks that they are Israel and that the 12 tribes belong only to them. That's their problem, right? But we understand that uh, the doctrine given by the great masters in the past was given for the whole of humanity, not for a certain elite that uh, believe themselves to be chosen. And this, we, we have to understand that. When we, follow, we fall into that, our soul, which is the number six, because you see the six-pointed start always point as Tifereth which is the sixth sephira, which is the human soul. When you count, you count the sephiroth, you find Tifereth here. 
which is the number six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number five also from the bottom, but from the top to the bottom is the number six. And that's why when you name the six-pointed star, immediately it's associated to Tifereth. And Tifereth is the human soul. And the human soul in Kabbalah is associated with Israel, because Israel is a compound of the different parts of the soul, the human soul that we have to develop when we enter into the path. And that's why the human soul is what incarnates in Malkut, in this physicality. The embryo of soul that has to develop as a human soul is here right now inside of our body. So that's why we are children of Israel. We are souls in the physicality. This is how we uh, understand it. And that's why the start of six points is symbolized by Tifereth and Malkut. Because in Kabbalah we say Tifereth is a husband and Malkut is the wife. Because Malka means queen. Malkut, the kingdom. Malka, the queen. And in Tifereth we find the Malachim or the kings. And these Malachim have their wives, their queens. So Tifereth and Malkut had to be together inside of us in order to work in this path. And that's why it is pointed that six points are male and the six entrances are female in order to understand that enter all of humanity, male and female. And that makes two six, which makes 12, right? But in the middle of the star is the hexagon or hexagram, right? There are six. So if we take that six of the hexagram or the hexagon, plus the six point of the six entrances, how many sixes do we find? We find three. Six, six, six. The beast, 666, is all of us. It is time now to understand that we always like to point at others. Or oh, the B666 is the Pope. No, 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 he's a, the actual president of the United States because make the addition, etc., etc. And when we are doing this and pointing at others, we ignore that three fingers are pointing at us by like saying, you are the big 666. Hmm? That is precisely a beast or a hayot, as we say in Kabbalah, a humanoid that has the possibility of becoming human. And all of that comes from the very bottom because the, six, the, beast, the beast 666 come from the abyss with all of those hashidim that we have within. So in the beginning, our innermost, our own particular Abraham, is not Abraham, but Abram. Abram. You read the book of Genesis in the beginning, Abraham was not Abraham, was Abram. Letter He is missing there. Because when he starts working in alchemy, with the waters of life, and then the H was added to him, Abraham. But before that, we are dealing only with boogies, with demons inside of us. All of that elements that we have within, our innermost, should enter into initiation. This is what the Sohar says. When Abraham, but when Abram 
enter into initiation in Egypt, of course, when you read the Egypt, you said, well, he went to, to the land of Egypt there in Africa, no? That will be the answer of it. No, but esoterically, alchemically speaking, means that when the innermost Abraham entered into initiation in Egypt, means here, in, a, in my physical body. When I started working with initiation, my being, my inner moth, started doing the work because he is the one that entered into initiation. It's not the ego, it's not the personality, it's the inner most. Hesed, Abraham. And then that Abraham becomes Abraham. And then your inner moth starts in the initiation of minor mysteries. Read the Zohar. The Zohar explains there how Abraham started the initiation of minor mysteries. But when he entered into the major mysteries, before engendering Isaac, God told him, now your name won't be Abraham, but Abraham. Because the letter He is with you, which symbolizes Malkut. You're going to work with the matrix, with the womb, with the woman. And he started and engendered Isaac. And this is how he says that uh, he was 100 years when he engendered Isaac. 100. Kabbalistic, alchemical speaking, means the physicality, the physical body. 100. That's the beginning, 100. Because we had to enter in 200 which is Yasad, 300, which is Had, 400, which is Netzah, 500, which is Tifereth, going up from the very bottom. And those are the ages that the Bible talk about. Esoteric, mystic, Kabbalistic, alchemical ages. When you work with your waters, when you work with Abraham, when you are the beast 666, you start working with your enemies because that makes addition of 18. Kabbalistically, number 18 is enemies. Where are those enemies? It's your egos, your defects, your vices. Don't fall into the mistake of thinking all oh, the enemies of Abraham are those that are atheists or that are polytheists. No, the enemies of Abraham are within us. You have to fight against them because they are following the evolution, the mechanicity of nature. Any animal does that. Any plant does that. But when we enter into the humanoid level, which in synthesis is the beast 666, we receive the opportunity of going out of the abyss. If we don't do it well, then we go inside and devolve like the ordinary people. Behold, here, continuing with the meaning of Malkut and the start of six points. Archivically, when you go, you find that Tejas or fire represents the upper triangle. But the upside down triangle is called Apas or water. And it's always located at the north of the tree of life and fire at the south of the tree of life. Now the east is always related with the air, which is the Tadva Vayu. And that is the symbol of Vayu. And the symbol of Prithvi, the earth, is precisely down here which is the West. This is how you find in alchemy. That's why uh, Malkut is symbolized by the cross. And that cross is related with the four elements. And that's why uh, when we talk about the four elements, you find that the 12 tribes of Israel related with the star of David relate to the elements too. For instance, Pisces is water. Uh, Scorpio is water. Cancer is water. Three signs of water among the twelve. And then you find air, 
Gemini is air. Aquarius is air. And the other one is Libra. Libra. You see, three signs of air. Three signs of earth. Taurus, Capricorn, and Virgo. Very problematic sign, by the way. <laughs> and then we find the signs of fire. Aries, Sagittarius, and Leo. You see, 12. It's always associated with the four elements. Malkut. This is how we are born. Master Samael says we are born in Malkut in order to get rounded with the forces of the elements, with the forces of the 12 zodiacal signs. And the Star of David is always associated with it. But remember that the Star of David has exactly the hexagon, the hexagon in the middle. Give it the other six. We have to control the three sixes. And then to get rid of it. And that's why in Kabbalah, we find <coughs> the three mother letters that we always find in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. When you find many symbols, when you find that these three mother letters are the origin of the other letters. The letter Aleph, for instance, symbolizes air. And in many lectures, we told you that the letter Aleph is associated with your spinal column. This is precisely the spinal column, the letter Vav in the middle of this letter and the shape of the letter Aleph. In the right, Above, we have the letter Yad, which is the Shakti potential of the cerebral and spinal fluid. And here we find the Shakti potential of the sexual fluid. And that is the letter Aleph, which is the wind, the spirit, the air. When you read about the spirit, the air of the wind, remember they are addressing Aleph. That's why the name of God in Hebrew, you added the letter Lamed and says El. It's associated with the air. And El, the letter Lamed, with the heart. El is here in your heart. And the letter Aleph is associated with your lungs, with your oxygen. But when you read Aleph, you have to understand that you are talking about your spinal column. The two waters, but they are directly pointed as the substance, the potency of the waters. You see, uh, for instance, there in Canada, the Niagara Falls gives a lot of electricity. That electricity, electricity comes from the waters. So when we say Shakti potential of the waters, we are talking about that electricity. Not the water itself, but that electricity which is within the water. And that is what the letter Aleph represents. Our spinal column dividing the two waters, creative waters, that we have in our system. And that's the letter Aleph. That's why it's always represented like this. You see the magician, Aleph. People that see there is is maybe singing something, no, representing this, you see? Because hand in Hebrew is Yad, and Yad is this. One Yad here, one Yad here. This represents my cerebral spinal fluid, and this is the sexual fluid, and my spinal column in the middle. That is a left. That's why the spinal column is called the throne of God. This is where the Spirit of God moves between the two waters. Forget about the macrocosmic waters. Let us talk about our microcosmic. So, when God sits on your spinal column, he's in between the two waters. And that God that sits there 
is Abraham. That's the spirit, the innermost. So Abraham is not of the past or the future, it's of the present. If we were to be a real children of Abraham, we have to sit him on our spinal column. Then we can go and say, I am a child of Abraham. And you don't identify with Muslims or with Jews or with Christians. I say, it's just Abraham is here inside of me. The incarnation of the spirit. And that was what the letter Aleph means. That's why it's a letter with, with you write God in Hebrew. Mem. As you see there, represents water. That's the other letter <coughs> that you find. In the word Mayim, for instance, Mizrahim, Miriam. So it means that the woman itself, is uh, the feminine aspect, is water. So God of the electricity, that what we call the Logos, the Prana, cannot exist without Mem. If we didn't have the cerebral and spinal fluid or the sexual fluid in our physicality, then the Shakti potential of the waters cannot exist in us. That's why we had to take care of the sexual fluids. When I say sexual fluids, I'm taking the two polarities. The cerebral spinal fluid is positive, while the negative is called Hava or Eve, the sexual fluid in the sexual glands. We have to take care of them if we want to work with the electricity, with that that we call the Shekinah, the fire of the Holy Ghost, and to get birth to the Savior inside. That's why you see there that the letter Mem is formed by the letter Kaf. This is the letter Kaf, which symbolizes your head. That's why, you know, in Judaism and Islam and many other religions, they cover their head to represent that letter Kaf. And the other letter that descends there is the spinal column, is the letter Vav. Hmm? That means that uh, the letter Mem hides the secret of creation. Without the fluids, we cannot channel energy. That's why we had to be care of our fluids in our physical body. Now, when we talk about the physical body, you see that the, the three primary letters or mother letters it says, and where is the earth? Why do they don't symbol the earth? Because the earth is, we are the earth. We have these three forces in us, but the earth itself is our physicality. And that is represented in the letter Shin, which is fire. There is one letter that always we associate with the physicality, and it's the letter Nun. If you see, for instance, the letter Shin here, it hides the letter Nun, the foundation, the very base going to the right, is a letter Nun there. And the letter Nun is holding two letter Vavs or two letter Zain, which are the two polarities of the spinal column, Shin. That's why the letter Shin, they said, has three vavs. Or what uh, in Sanskrit we call Ira Pingala and Shushumna. The three nervous systems that we have in our physicality. The central nervous system, the grand sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system. So Shin, 
is of course related with our nervous system. But all of that force of Shin crystallizes in the letter Nun. That's why that is the very foundation of the letter Shin is the letter Nun. And the letter Nun is of course related with fish. We said Nun in Aramaic is fish, related with the sperm and the ova in women. And it's because when a man and a woman are united in the sexual act, shin, fire, is there. They work with the water and with the air. You see the three forces there working in themselves. So that is what is fire in us. The fire in us circulates in the central nervous system, in the grand sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system. And our, our physicality, that is what we call malchut, the kingdom. In other uh, in other lectures, we explain that malchut, the kingdom, is a union or the mixture of all the forces. P.C. Sophia called the physical body the mixture. And it's because everything descends from above in this one unity that we call physicality. We have fluids, water. We have air in our lungs. We have fire in our nervous system. And the same physical body is the earth. That's why it was represented, you see as you find here, the earth as Mizrahim. But Mizrahim has two mems, means two waters. The upper Egypt and the lower Egypt. And it is, of course, the Nile. The river Nile. Which if you use your imagination, you will see that Egypt is talking about you, physically speaking. Lower Egypt, upper Egypt. Or if you want to change it, upper and lower. But there's two waters there, right? The two waters or the two parts of, of Egypt. And all of that mysteries that you find among the river Nile are mysteries that are within you. And that's why Abraham went there. Because Abraham is the innermost, is a spirit that hovers upon the face of the waters. The waters of Mizraim the waters of Egypt. And he went there in order to work in the initiation. And this is how each of our spirits or inner modes have to do. They have to descend and work in us, physically speaking. If you want to enter into the initiation, you have to pray to your inner most, which is your inner Abraham, father of many, but that archetype is within. Help me to walk on the path. And then he descends from his sphere, which is the seventh dimension, into your physicality. And that happens, if I'm telling you, it's because that happens to me. I call my God, my inner being, my spirit, help me. And he comes and descends into my physicality and give me the hand his hand and I, the soul, start talking and praying to him, help me, because I'm part of you. I am your inferior part. And by working together, we will go out of this demonic planet, because it's terrible, this planet in which we live right now. We are in Kali Yuga, and each time is getting worse and worse. Remember that Abraham took Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and after that, he was destroyed. Abraham is the only one that can take you out. Because he is the child of the three primary forces. And by doing that internally, individually, this is how we walk on the path of initiation. 
First, nine initiation of minor mysteries, and then the major initiations. Read the Zohar, I'm telling you, because the Zohar talks about this. Very clear. This great rabbi, illuminated rabbi, uh, Ravi uh, Shimon Ben Hohai. He's the one. Remember, we worship the Jews. The Jews that we worship, we name them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Jesus, the prophets, which are true Jews that incarnated Judah, the solar light. Those are the true Jews that we are, that's why we are always emphasizing that. And Shimon ben Hohai was a true Jew. Because in this physical world, there are people that call the same Jews, but they don't do anything about this. It's like in India. A lot of people that call it the same Brahmins, and they don't do anything about that. A real Brahmanism. So to become a true Jew, you have to work with your archetypes inside. In order to finally, one day, to enter into the promised land, which is a fourth dimension. Here you see the, the symbol of Egypt. If you put here the central nervous system, the Nile, the lower and upper Egypt in your central nervous system, then you understand why Abraham went there to work with initiation. And now you understand the exodus coming from this physicality or physical world into the promised land, which is symbolized by Canaan or Israel there, but symbolically speaking, because you have to go through all of this in the wilderness, which means from Malkut to Yesod, in order to enter into the fourth dimension with all this transformation that we had to do. Because in the fourth dimension live another humanity. People think that this three-dimensional humanity is the only humanity in this planet. They are wrong. There are two types of humanities in this planet Earth. First, the demonic humanity which is us, three-dimensionally speaking. But in the fourth dimension, the superior part of the fourth dimension, live another humanity. It's that dimension that the Bible called Eden. There, we find the great resurrected masters. In the upper part of the fourth dimension, I repeat, not in the lower, because there is also lower, and I don't want to talk about them. So, remember, when you read the sacred scriptures, remember that Abraham is your innermost. And that he is the only one that walked with God. Because Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham is still a friend of God. The upper forces beyond Hesed, is the only one that can obey and take our soul out of the level in which we have it. Do you have questions? Uh, no, that's another spelling. Hasidism is a, a type of Orthodox Judaism. But uh, the Hasidim are, of course, all the uh, different uh, inner mosques or igneous particles that we have, which are still at the level of the animal kingdom. As I said, and also plant kingdom is Hasidim are monads, spirits, that still are in evolution. And in order to enter into that path, then we had to practice 
because there are many, uh, how do you call the Hasidism, Hasidics, and many other sects of Judaism and Christianity and, and even in Islam, that they don't walk on the path. The inner mosque, the inner being, is still at the level of Hashidim. Because in order to follow the path, or to follow yod Hey vav Hey, then Abraham stopped being Abraham, or, or at the level of Hashidim, and entered into Abraham, with the, with the letter Hey, which had a level of a human being. But remember that this Abram exists within the innermost parts of any animal, any plant, any mineral, and any humanoid. But only as the humanoids have the opportunity to work with our own particular Abram and transform into Abraham. And then is how you, we enter, of course, there are many groups, sects, that uh, think that uh, just by following certain rules is enough in order to become uh, children of the promise. Which means uh, uh, a true children of God. But the problem is that in order for us to become a true child of God, we have to work with the waters. Remember that the waters are the vehicle of the electricity. That's why when we work with our sexual energy, we are transmuting the Shakti potential of that waters. When we are vocalizing or doing different exercises in relation with our spinal column, the energy that activates the chakras or the churches of our spinal column are the electricity hidden within the cerebral spinal fluid. And is our innermost the one that is doing it because he is the one that floats between the two waters. If we do it with ego, then we develop fanaticism. But uh, in order to develop in the right way, we have to be in chastity. Because only the animals fornicate. Fornication is orgasm, spasm. Chastity is transmutation of the waters of Eden. So you mentioned the, uh, the initiatic years from 100 to 200 to 300 the major mysteries. What are the years related with the uh, serpents of light? Same. We were said 100 years in the light, or 200 years in the light, right? Because uh, we enter until Chesed, which is the seventh Sephira, the 700 years. When we enter into, into the first triangle, and then it is the years of a thousand. Yeah, a thousand years, Bina. 2,000 years, Chokmah, 3,000 years, Keter. Before entering into those 100 levels of ages of, of life, before 100, you are 90, 70, 80, 60. Those are the uh, minor mysteries. So in order to enter into the major mystery, you have to have the age, or your being has to have the age, of 90, 99 years old. And also about the serpents of life, do you actually have to pass through initiations for the serpents of um, Hesed and Geburah, or are those, those serpents of light already risen? No. The serpents of fire are different. The serpents of fire, of course, because Hesed and Geburah are always standing. Yeah. But when you work with the serpents of light, you have to go even to Bina to rise the serpent of Bina in the light. So those are more initiations? Is the initiations of light. Because remember that Bina is the Holy Spirit. And we killed Bina, the Holy Spirit, the God Mercury, with fornication. 
So that's why when we talk about resurrection, it's resurrection in Bina. When all of the forces of the Holy Spirit become purified in different levels. Because Bina has his kingdom in the sexual organs. So the resurrection means that we no longer uh, prostitute the God Mercury. Talking in alchemy, because the God Mercury is, uh, you know, the different Mercuries that we have in the physicality. Beaut Mercury, we have to annihilate the dry Mercury. The dry Mercury is all those egos that we have within. And then to perfect ourselves to the level of Bina. Then we become human beings into the image of Bina. Because it is written that Bina, his holy name is Jehovah Elohim. And it's written in the Bible that Jehovah Elohim created Adam into his own image, into his own likeness. It means perfect. But we are not at that level because we fall. So when we again recuperate that level of purity in Bina, then we just repent and say, Forgive me, Father, for I sin. And then Bina said to you, don't do it again. Because our punishment is going to be more severe. You said at the beginning of the lecture that in order for us to understand these lectures or the esoteric teachings that we had to listen with our activated chakras as opposed to our intellect. How do we know if we're doing that, listening with our activated chakras? <coughs> Well, we know it when we meditate. Because when we listen or read any uh, sacred scripture, after reading just a little bit enough in order to comprehend what we read, we sit down in meditation. And through meditation is how your inner most, Abraham, will show you the meaning of that. And then you are learning. Now, in the beginning, of course, it depends uh, uh, how activated are your chakras. Because we have to develop them 100%. And uh, positively, because the chakras can rotate backwards. And, and that's, that's dangerous. Because when the chakra rotate backwards, then your inner must is not acting through it, but the ego. And an ego of mythomania can come into the internal planes and tell you, you are the master such and such. You are really self-realized. Right? And in the spirit, you return and say, oh yeah, I am that. But if you have the ego alive, how are you going to be that? So that's why we insist always in rotating the chakras in the positive manner. That's why the Master talks about that in many books. Because there are many individuals in this day and age that put in activity the chakras, but in a negative manner. And they, they see only their desires, dreams, that doesn't coincide with the reality. Master Samael on the old wrote, If what we see, if what we experience in the internal worlds out of the body, does not coincide with your life in the physical plane, then is a lie. You have to be patient and to see, did that coincide with this? Right? It doesn't coincide, you are cheating yourself. This is the path of the razor's age. Good and evil. You have to be always silent, and meditating, comprehend. Sometimes your ego wants to push you aside. Sometimes your being is showing you the path. How do you discover when is your ego, what is your being? When you meditate, when you pray, and when you follow the rules written in the books. That's called the Deuteronomius, or the written law. 
until you are really uh, convinced that you can hear your God face to face because to talk with your innermost face to face is possible. But for that, you have to annihilate a lot of ego. At least 90%. Before seeing your God face to face. But your God can also guide you, even if you don't see him. And that's, uh, that's the clue. Meditation. Do you have any other question? Experiencing the promised land, is that just a state of perception where you're here amongst everyone and you're perceiving the events in a completely different way? Or is it that you actually go off as the sun sets? Well, you can visit the promised land, the fourth dimension, with your astral body or with your mental body or in a state of samadhi. You can enter into that promised land and to see the reality of the fourth dimension. <clears throat> but there are many practices that you say the shamans, natives do, in order to penetrate into the fourth dimension. It's called gene state. And of course, this is just, uh, we will say, uh, like uh, visiting the fourth dimension, like touristing, we will say. Because to remain there, only if you are a resurrected master. That's precisely the, the, the promised land for the resurrected masters. They work until the whole body belongs to that dimension completely. Those individuals can come from the fourth dimension and to appear in a three-dimensional world. But naturally, they belong to the fourth dimension. In our case, we belong to the three-dimensional world because we are fallen. But with certain procedures of uh, magic, techniques, you can enter into the fourth dimension, but at a very lower level, and to experience what is to be in the fourth dimension. But you have to return into this physical world, because this is where you belong. Uh, Master Samael on Veor explains in one, many of his books that in the beginning when he entered into the fourth dimension, he entered in a very lower level. But with practices and his assisting in the path, they uh, really enter into the higher dimensions. And then he was visiting other temples or the White Lodge, other humanities that exist in the superior levels of the fourth dimension. Because in the inferior levels of the fourth dimension, well, you know, witches enter, sorcerers. And that is, they know how to enter with certain procedures, but as I said, they're just visiting there. They have to return. And our goal in this path is to remain there. For instance, Moses achieved it. There are many masters that live there. And they can come and assist you. Madame Blavatsky, for instance, the writer of the Secret Doctrine, Isis on Veil, he was assisted by two masters of the fourth dimension. Moria and Kutumi, and this other one, Duhal Kul. They were instructing her in what he wrote and was teaching. And she learned from them. The same, you can be a disciple of those masters of uh, the superior levels or of the lower levels. If you want to be in the lower levels, read that uh, Don Juan. <laughs> and anybody can enter into those levels so you have any other question thank you very much To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, 
available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.